It's easy to hear your favorite artist on WFPK from wherever you are. Listen on your smart speaker, live stream from our website at WFPK.org from Louisville Public Media. Consequence Podcast Network. Welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with the interview series presented by WFPK at WFPK.org. Consequence and the Consequence Podcast Network. Thanks as always for making your way here, checking out this episode in the series. Hit that subscribe button. Hit it, hit it, hit it. So you can keep up with all the interviews that we put out every single week. Brand new one every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. It's a great way to keep up with your favorite artists, discover some new ones, know what's happening in the music world. Uh, iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Acast. Uh, NPR, YouTube for the video versions, or anywhere you get your podcast from. I'm Kyle Meredith. Today, my guest, Credence Clearwater Revival drummer Doug Cosmo Clifford. We're going to be talking about the album For All the Money in the World. This is a record that he wrote and recorded with uh, Steve Wright in the mid-80s, but kept inside his Cosmos vault until now. So he's going to tell us about why set on the album for so long, tapping Joe Satriani to play guitar on the LP, and the other vault records that are going to be seeing release soon. That includes collaborations with Bobby Whitlock, uh, Doug Som, and a solo LP as well. Now, Doug's also going to tell us why he and uh, CCR bassist Stu Cook recently brought uh, Creedence Clearwater Revisited to a close after over 20 years of that offshoot. So let's do this, discussing for all the money in the world. It's Kyle Meredith with Doug Cosmo Clifford. Hey, Kyle. How's it going? Man, it's been great. Uh, it's good to talk to you again. I've had so much fun listening to a completely surprise album to us for all the money in the world. Uh, it's such a great listen. Uh, not so much a surprise for you, as I understand you've been sitting on this one for quite some time, haven't you? Well, I have, and uh, it was well worth the wait. So what is the story here? Because this is a record that you recorded with Steve Wright over 30 years ago. Um, what what brought it on, and, and what why sit on it this whole time? Well, uh, we were trying to... Uh, first of all, we started out uh, writing together, and uh, it, it, it was a real nice partnership, very easy to do. Uh, we, you know, we put it hand in glove. But the next thing you know, we have a bunch of songs, and so I said, let's record these things, so... You know, then we can move on. And, uh, and I, when I record, I like to get record quality uh, recordings as a producer. And uh, so um, that's why they sound, they don't sound like demos. And we also were going to put together a band. So uh, I brought in some guitar players. We had everybody that the guitar players, and uh, we have three monster guitar players, Joe Satriani, Greg Douglas, and Jimmy Ryan, uh, all on this record. And they're all uh, Bay Area guys, Bay Area, you know, San Francisco Bay Area, and the East Bay, which is the blue-collar side, uh, not the fancy side, uh, uh, over in San Francisco, so we're we're more in the rock and roll side of it, the blues side of it. That that was sort of our forte. Uh, and uh, uh, after you know, we had done done uh, probably nine different recordings. Uh, that's why I have all the guitar players. I wouldn't have them all in one session. That would be kind of, kind of crazy. But anyway, what we came up with is eleven songs that sound just terrific together, and it's uh, you know rock and roll and. Uh, uh, boy, do we need some rock and roll now. Uh, but to, b- back to your question, uh, when things didn't go the, the way we wanted them to, to go, the way things were moving that fast, and other other things, uh, life, kids, uh, all of that sort of thing, uh, I put it in Cosmo's vault. My nickname is Cosmo, so I have a vault. And into the vault they went. <laughs> And uh, I have about 10 albums worth of stuff with different artists, uh, and uh, eventually it'll all come out. But right now, uh, for all the money in, in the world, is, is, is the album and the, uh, the first single off the album. Really a terrific singer in Keith England, and so it's kind of a super session, really, with the, with the guys uh, that we had uh, uh, playing and Steve Wright's uh, just a monster bass player, so he and I 
loved getting down in, in the trenches and and uh, pounding out the the rhythm section work. So it's a an all around really cool listen as it, to quote you, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm very proud of it and. and have to get it out so people can hear it. So in terms of that, to me, it's new music because it hasn't been exposed to a, a, a listening audience yet. Well, it's it's absolutely new to us. And, and you're right, it was fun even from the get-go, even before the notes, uh, the first notes heard on my part. I saw who was involved in it, and you see those names. Uh, you, you mentioned Satriani. I think that was the one that stood out because, you know, he, he's not doing... I guess what you would say his typical stuff on this one, like how did you know that he would work with what you all were doing? Well, uh, all those guitar players at one time or another were in the great Ken band. So, uh, and then Steve was of course in the great Ken band as well. Uh, and so we were looking for a, a guy for a, a session to record the, the lead parts on for at least four songs. And so uh, Steve suggested we use Joe and uh, uh, and so it was an audition as well as a recording session. And I asked him if he would like to join the band, and he said no. He he's going to do uh, a, a instrumental a metal uh, record, record. And we all looked, looked at him and rolled our eyes and said, "Good luck with that." Well, last laughs are, are the best laughs, and boy, did he get us on that one. Uh, the the first single, I mean, right from the get go with with the title track there, I mean, um, you know, it does evoke a bit of an era, and and I was uh, like, it sounds like an '80s record, but it also doesn't sound like an '80s record, and I think that you know goes to attest to you as a as a producer as well that you know it sort of uh, fits the period, but it, it works outside of it as well. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but is that something that you kind of that you were going for at the time, if you remember? Well, uh, you know, you, you, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, that's Everybody I've talked to in, in these interviews uh, has said the same thing, uh, you know. And so I, I think it's a combination of, of the song. Uh, a song, a good song will, will be around 10 years, 20 years, 30 years in this case. And, and then also, uh, when I, when I, as I say, when I uh, produce uh, a session, I'm in there like I'm producing uh, a record that's going to be a, a release of, from, from uh, an artist that, uh, you know, is, is professionally done. So uh, I just put my, uh, my computer and my, uh, my uh, production uh, gear on and went in and to any session that I, that I do, especially if I'm mixing. Uh, that, that's that's where it all comes down. You you, know, you get good good uh, recordings from everybody, and boy did we have some great guys. And then uh, then then you go into the mixing phase, and it's a totally different different ballgame. So uh, that's how I I approach music really. If I'm uh, going to write something and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm have it, yeah, a demo for someone, I don't want to have just an acoustic guitar and a, and a, and a vocal that isn't even wet. So uh, I like to have that. You know, there's only one chance to you know, make a first impression. So that's how I approach uh, making my records and recording uh, sessions in general. Well, I also, I mean, there's there's so many cool tracks on here. Uh, Lonesome Boy, I think I'm a big fan of. It's got a bit of a Rod Stewart swagger to it. I don't know. Oh, yeah. So what else is in the vault? I mean, if the, if this is something that you've been sitting on, it, it, are all the rest of the albums to this this quality and caliber? Well, yeah, they, they are. Uh, I have uh, one with Bobby Whitlock. It's the same, same combination. We co-wrote all the material, and we had a, a, a little band going. And uh, but uh, his wife uh, wanted, didn't like living in the East Bay, and she wanted to live in, in London. And, uh, and so, in the middle of the night, off he went, and there I was holding the bag. So, into the vault she goes, and when it comes out, nobody knows. So, uh, that'll be the next release. Uh, and then I have uh, uh, another solo. I, I have a solo album that I have put out there uh, last year just when the pandemic hit not a good time to, to do that but at any rate uh, that, that was in there uh, 
got another solo album that's worth uh, stuff in there that's a little more country than than the, the first one. I've got a Sir Douglas Quintet and Sir Doug, Doug song. I've got a, uh, a whole album of, of, of him. And, and so I've got some pretty cool stuff. Good, 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 good artist to, to work with. Yeah, wow. Uh, you, you're, you've got me baited at least I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm in for all of them <laughs> that you said right there. D- does this have, I mean, putting revisited to bed, has that opened the door also for all of this to finally put, uh, you know, some concentration on it? Well, uh, yeah, you're, you're exactly right. You know, I have a, uh, uh, you know, a dear spot on my heart, Stu and I, Stu Cook, I just I there for Creedence Clearwater Revival, my old pal, 60 years making records together and playing music. Uh, we had a plan, uh, and it was like, uh, uh, we were hoping to get four years out of that project. We got 25 years out of that project. <laughs> so... Uh, you know, things are, uh, are funny sometimes. It was a fan-driven uh, project, whatever the fans wanted, we, that's what we did. We never planned on recording in, in, in that project. The fans wanted a, a CD after the show. We uh, it somehow got, uh, and South by Southwest got in the hands of an independent uh, record company, and they took it gold, and then uh, they, uh, it was a, uh, most money they'd ever made, so he decided to resurrect the, the, the uh, career of Julian Lennon. Bad idea, because uh, our next royalty check bounced. We said, you can't bounce checks to us and, and still have us stick around, so we got out, got out of that and then uh, went to a major label and uh, they took a platinum. So, you know, it's been a, a, a storied career, but, you know, I, I was traveling and touring year-round for 25 years, so it was time to uh, put that to bed. We, you know, it, it served its purpose. Uh, I have Parkinson's as well, started to come in, so uh, we, we don't do any uh, non credence songs, but I was, I was kind of trying to learn to shake, rattle, and roll. I thought that might be appropriate for, for my affliction, so uh, that's a little Parkinson's humor. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, you know, it, it allowed me now uh, to stay, I stay home. I, have, I do it all out of my studio office. And uh, I can spend uh, the right amount of time to uh, promote, and that's why I'm talking to you now. Well, Cosmo, it's been great talking to you. And uh, again, this is so much fun hearing for all the money in the world. Thank you for what you're doing. I cannot wait to hear the rest of the vaults. And it's uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you, man. Thank you so much. Pleasure's mine. And that, uh, all I ask is that you, if you do anything to get it on a playlist, you help, give me a helping hand. R- radio is what made Credence. Because we were on a jazz label, they didn't know what to do, but radio knew what to do with us, and they, they're still playing our records 53 years uh, down, the, down the road. So uh, hats off to radio, and, I, and I, I, I love radio. Thank you so much, man. We'll see you around. Take care. Uh, all right, Kyle. Take care. Cosmo Clifford there. So you want to be a rock and roll star? No? Well, how about a podcast star? Well, as it turns out, there's a new all-in-one platform just for you. It's called Anchor, and it's the easiest way to make a podcast. And check this out. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. And then Anchor will distribute the podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify and Apple Podcast, and, you know, everywhere else in, uh, in podcast land. And what's even better, you can actually make money from your podcast. Go figure. Uh, no minimum listenership on that. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. So go ahead. Download the free Anchor app right now or go to anchor.fm to get started. So what are you waiting for? Podcast stardom is within your reach. Now, it was uh, just a few years ago, back in 2019, that I caught up with uh, Creedence Clearwater uh, Revival bassist Stu Cook about Creedence Clearwater Revisited. Uh, it was on their, uh, the final tour that was happening that year, so we got to talk about what it was like having a second life with the uh, revival songs uh, for the last 25 years, why it was time to put it to rest. We also hear about their association with The Big Lebowski and Stephen King, uh, the 50th anniversary at that point of Woodstock, Woodstock 69, 
and the pair of uh, Rocky Erickson records that Stu produced in the 80s. So I'm going to include that one here as part two. Credence, here's Stu Cook. Good morning. I, I got to say what an honor it is to talk to you first. Uh, so th- there's an upcoming tour with uh, with Revisited and um, and everything that's going on there. But uh, we'll get to that in a second. I thought we'd start with the beginning because, you know, as anniversaries go, if we want to split hairs, it's kind of the 60th anniversary uh, of the band if you want to go back to the beginning, right? It, like predating all the others. Well, yeah, I guess we could look at it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Close I've, I've known Doug for be 61 years uh, this September. And uh, it was about a year after I first met him that we uh, got together with John Fogarty and uh, formed the Blue Velvets. So, yeah, I hadn't even thought about that. Amongst all the other anniversaries and celebrations going on, last year was Creedence Clearwater Revival's 50th, Mm -hmm. Woodstock 50 this year, Revisited 25 this year. (laughs) It's everything in there. I thought, you know, you you all having started, you know, so... 59 60 i mean it does it's it's before it's before the second wave of rock and roll i mean you you all you know by, by the time it all did roll around as history has told many many times you know you, you had been together for a while but to see all of that i mean it changed so much so quickly what was that transition like for you all and did you find it natural and easy Nah, you know i'm on the inside right so i have a different perspective than than a writer or a critic or a fan in general to me, it seemed uh, like a fairly logical evolution, actually. We started with a, a core of, uh, of music that we all agreed that we liked, rhythm and blues. Some country was you know, our core uh, agreement. And uh, as we got better, we were, became uh, you know, more able to express ourselves like the people we had idolized when we first began. Once it all happens, it happened very quickly. <laughs> it looks like about a three and a half year rocket ride. Yeah, what I recall. But you know, when you talk about 1969, as as many of us do, and and especially on the 50th anniversary, you know, a, a lot of artists are, are talked about, but it it does seem like nobody had more of a 1969 than than Creedence Clearwater Revival. I mean, three records in in one year. Which is, and all three of them are amazing. They're all great. Talking about Bayou Country and Green River and Willie and the Poor Boys. For something that's happening in that quickest succession, do those records are, do they sound separate in your mind or is that all just one clump of music? <laughs> well, it's a, it's a bit of both. I'd, I'd have to say that, that uh, it was, you know, a pretty intense period for the band. Uh, Bayou Country was recorded in 68 but released January of 69. So it, it, it can be lumped in, you know, but like I said, it was all part of, uh, you know, we would make singles. And when you had enough singles, then you would almost had an album. Then you would do a couple of what they eventually called album tracks. And then you would have a complete record and out it would go. But we were recording singles all the time. So uh, it, it seemed like, you know, one long record to us. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, and when you got between eight, eight and eleven of them together, then uh, you, you you know you put out an album, and albums uh, had just become the, the new uh, the new medium. Uh, you know, when we grew up, it was singles, forty mm-hmm. fives, right? Then uh, came the long play. First, there was seventy eights, right? That, that broke very easily, <laughs> and then the forty fives were flexible vinyl, big hole in the middle, and then the long play, thirty three and a third, double sided. So you got maybe you could get depending on the length of of the the program you could get four or five maybe six songs aside. So uh, yeah, that 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 was a change in in the marketplace in the industry. But but for us it was it was just making something for the radio. Right, and recording Some, somebody else almost it, it sounds like somebody else almost slips a, a slaps a title on it eventually to say these songs go together now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean they had to. Right, <laughs> right, right. Well, you know, so, of course, you know, you can't look at that year with, without Woodstock. And we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of Woodstock. Um, the concert is finally getting released on August 2nd. I know that big box set is coming out as well. But, you know, in, in that moment, you, you know, what I've got written down here was uh, the moment versus what it became. Because in that moment, was it just another show? Pretty much. Yeah, uh, it, it was uh, the summer of, of uh, festivals. All you know, there was festivals all over the country, coast to coast, and in the middle as well. At the time, you know, it, it, it seemed like it was a, a pretty big undertaking. Uh, but you know, they, they all were. We never really thought that it was uh, going to be uh, such a remembered uh, event. 
you know, there were bigger festivals for sure, and there have been since. But the, but I think it was the spirit of the of the the crowd that makes it stand out. Now, I look at it now, and I think the the bands were just the 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 background music for some other kind of event that happened that nobody hadn't happened before and hasn't happened since. That's my takeaway now. You know, when we, but you know, on the other hand, when we came over the hill. In the in the helicopter to to get to the concert site and there was a sea of humanity. It was it was quite a sight to uh, to behold. You know, was there a moment that you noticed uh, that that it had become something different? Uh, you know, years down the road or whatever. Well, sure. I mean, once once the, all the stories were were woven together and and I, we had a film to document, you know, to show all the stuff. You couldn't possibly know everything that went on, even if you were there. You were you couldn't have known everything that. Uh, that was transpiring. So the film is a was a you know, a great document of uh, when you know, what, what people can do, how how it how it can happen. It's uh, mired in controversy right now. I don't I don't know. Do you know if if there's going to be um, that something? I, I last I heard was that the the venue had had been. Right. Pulled. It, it has. So sort of like the first one, right? <laughs> it didn't have a venue either. Well, you know, Michael Lang has a has a way of, uh, it, it seems, of, um, I don't know what's, you know, I'll say a bit candidly here, and, and you know, I'll, I'll make sure to point out that I'm not projecting, I'm not putting words in your mouth, it's my opinion here, that um, it seems like anybody, everybody tries to put on a festival, and they can pull it off once, like anybody can do a festival these days, and that makes it really surprising to me that, that Woodstock has had so much trouble, because if any festival is going to get off the ground these days, I feel like that would be uh, one of the easiest, but it is marred in controversy again, and and who knows, because I haven't, I mean, there are bands still on the bill, uh, <laughs> you know, whether yeah. or not it happens. I, I don't know. I think it's, you know, I, I got, yeah, anybody can do a festival. Michael Lang has, has done all the Woodstock festivals. Some were, you know, the first one was the one. Uh, he's also did the one that t- turned into riots and chaos. So uh, I, I don't know that that, that it makes any sense to try and recreate with another concert you know, to, 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 to celebrate the first one. But uh I'm watching this one from the sidelines. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I do think it all is all about, as you mentioned, the spirit of it. I mean, as you said, that's that is what made uh, that first one so memorable. '94 was a good concert. It was really, uh, you know, for a lot of the lineup right there. But um, did music change the world? I mean, with, with with all of that spirit and the music as the background, you know, can it? You know, and and, and is that possible yeah. today? You know, for something like this, uh, I'm afraid it isn't. I don't know that it ever was uh, able to change the world with music. Uh, I'm referring to. It brings people together. It's a, it's a very unique art form that in that it is really doesn't have any guardrails, and uh, you know it's very difficult for uh, for it to be uh, co-opted. You know, it's it's personal, it's universal at the same time. It's 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 it's, uh, it's quite a gift. And uh, combined with the spirit of Woodstock, you know, people thought that there was something, something there. But uh, on its own, music has devolved into uh, some other kind of product, you know, that, that you eat now. <laughs> it's very disposable. So, you know, I guess everybody w- would hope that uh, eyes could be opened and kept open. But, you know, we quickly move on. So, uh, you know, certainly John Lennon took a shot at that. And you know, got a lot of attention, and then you know, and it made sense. But I think it has to be evaluated or you know, viewed with you know what what has actually changed to try and keep it going is, is the hard part. You know, the idea is is always great, but the act, you know, keeping it going is the hard work, right? So right. I wouldn't expect that to be the, the 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 true function of music. So it's always nice to have music, though. You know, uh, it <laughs> It may not fix the problems of the world, but it it makes your day nicer. I'll actually jump around too because you know the, there is the power of music ma- making. Because as um, Creedence Clearwater revisited now, you know here you are on on a farewell tour. But there's a there, there, there is a, a partnership, right? Uh, something that you guys are doing towards the end of the tour with uh, with a museum of music uh, making music and the friends of uh, San Pasquale Academy. Uh, this has to do though with the power of music a bit, the, like those those. Um, those entities there, right? Well, of course. Uh, I mean, it, it, music is what brings the you know all the energy together in one spot. But uh, that alone isn't enough, right? People have people have to actually do the hard work. It's it's great inspiration in that you know, and, you know my career has has 
never failed to amaze me. <laughs> how, how uh, you know, how just something as simple as, you know, a three chord song can, uh, how far it can take you. You know, I've been around the world several times based on a 40 or 50 songs. <laughs> You, you know, the, it is all part of the farewell tour as, as you're being billed. Why, why is this the farewell tour? Uh, and, and does this mean retirement or what, what, what exactly does that? Because that's a loaded word for a lot of people. Yeah, I know. Retirement's bad, right? <laughs> <laughs> work, work until you drop. No, we're uh, hanging it up this year because we're still hitting on all eight cylinders. We're, we're consistent. We're having a good time with the music. But, uh, it, you know, we've the road is just not a place where you want to be. You know, we've done it for 25 years. We've been we've been to some places, you know, over a dozen times. And uh, you know, there's still time left in our lives to to do other things that we also enjoy. You know, we've got we've all got bigger families now. We have grandkids, which we like to spend more time with, and we've still got some additional traveling to do. My wife and I are still checking things off the list. I like to uh, spend some time in uh, Central America uh, where I do uh, do a lot of vacationing. And, uh, you know, it's just time to move on, really. Uh, 25 years is, is 20 more than we ever thought we'd do this. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's, it's been a great ride. And, uh, you know, the, the, the support of the Creedence Clearwater Revival fans has been terrific. You know, the project was started just to celebrate and honor the, the quartet, the work of the quartet, and uh, and to get us out of the house, you know. And yeah. now it's time, I think, we, you know, we some of our time could be better spent around the house. So, uh, you know, Doug and I are neither going to leave. We're not leaving the music business. We're not leaving music. Uh, but we are leaving the road. Yeah, I'd read that, uh, you know, when, when you all started Revisited, uh, Doug had actually considered that he was probably retired at that point. 25 years yeah. ago. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, I ended up, uh, I was living in Los Angeles and, uh, you know, it was time for a change. So I, I ended up in uh, Incline Village, Nevada, where Doug and his family had been living for 10 years or something like that, 10, 12 years. I forget exactly how many, but uh, yeah. So we started hanging out, jamming all the time. And, you know, the idea to, to get back in the saddle was almost obvious, you know, but up until then, you know, we, we distance had uh, kept us from really focusing on uh, on anything, any kind of collaboration. But when we just lived across town from each other, <laughs> it made all the sense in the world to get together and, and hang out and start playing and looking for other guys to play. And so it, it was we, we had no idea where it was taking us until now, you know, this year we realize, you know, it's taken us. We've gone as far as, as as we really want to with this project. It's, it's been a terrific experience, and uh, you know we're always blessed to, to get a second bite of the apple, especially when it's so sweet. But I like to put it this way: there's more sand in the bottom of the glass than the top right now. And for me, it, it doesn't make a lot a lot of sense to keep doing the same thing over and over again when I can be doing other things that I put on the back shelf. Well, I know you've done um, producing and, 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 of course, collaborating all throughout all through your career. I, I did want to bring up one of those um, because you produced uh, one of uh, Rocky Erickson's uh, records with, with the evil one, uh, who we, of course, lost earlier this year. And talk about one of those artists who just deserved more. Uh, you know, we're such big fans of him around here. Did did you all keep in touch through the years? Uh, yes and no. You know, we saw each other. Uh, I was living in Austin for a while, and uh, I would see Rocky around town and uh, you know, attend his performances whenever I could. But uh, you know, it was a we recorded 15 songs together, which were spread out over two albums. The first one was called The Evil One. The second one was just shortened to T E O. So there's in their original configuration, there are you know five shared songs and five different songs on on each disc. But uh, yeah, that was quite an experience. I think I, you know, that was when I really realized what what a record producer was supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> Rocky didn't make it easy for me, but we had a great time, and I think the, I think the result stands the test of time. It was a very productive era or period in, in Rocky's life. Mm -hmm. He was uh, really on his game. You know, he had a lot of ups and downs, and uh, I thought this. I thought the that, uh, the work we did together was, was some of the best. That he that he did in his whole career, you know, it just and it came together in a kind of a crazy way. It was very organic, and I know that he that he liked the records that that we did, so that you know that's enough for me. Uh, is that something you're going to do more of? Or are you looking to do more? Of? You know, I really don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to 
scuba dive more. I'm going to play golf more. I'm going to ride my bike more. Uh, and, you know, I've, I've, every once in a while, I'll, I'll do some project for somebody. I'll, you know, lay down some bass tracks for people that, you know, were interested in, in my style of playing. I uh, want, want to incorporate it in, into what they're doing. You know, I'd be, I do that kind of stuff. Uh, I've had an offer to produce uh, some tracks for other artists. You know, I don't, really don't, I don't have a plan. Right now, the plan is to play great this year. That's an easy plan. That's uh, that's yeah. <laughs> keep it easy in the sights. Uh, I'll finish up here with a bit more of a trivial question too, because uh, you know, Credence has um probably been used in movies just about more than any other band. The the the, the songs in there, and I couldn't even pretend to start naming half of them. <laughs> do, do you got a favorite? Uh, you know, do, is there is there a favorite movie moment with a uh, with a CCR song that that you've got? Yeah, I think that uh, although it's not. A song per se. It's uh, in the Big Lebowski. Oh yeah. I mean, the dude's car is stolen, and he's talking to the cop about the about the the incident, and uh, he mentions that the that the there was a Credence tape. Paraphrasing it, you know, the, and the cop says, "Well, we, you know, we might be able to get your car back, but well, I wouldn't hold up hold out any hope for the Credence tape." <laughs> Words to that effect. Anyhow, it's uh, it's always nice to be written into a script. You know, it's almost better. It's almost better than. Uh, than than having a song in the in the movie is to actually you know been inside the writer's head so much that you you know Stephen King has done that as well with Credence he'll use Credence to uh, to describe a time and a feeling you know just to take you into his writing so you know that that's the highest honor I think it just seemed like for a long time there if there was um if there was a war scene especially a Vietnam scene you, you oh, knew yeah, that right. you know. Run through the jungle was going to be played, or fortunate you one of those, you know, something like that yeah. was going to be played. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, run through the jungle isn't even about the Vietnam War. Yeah. So, <laughs> but anyway, the people associate, and then it's very difficult to unassociate, right? Well, it's interesting. By the way, side note, uh, Louisville, uh, it's where I'm based, right here, and we're the home of the Lebowski Fest. We have nothing oh, to really? do with the movie, but we are uh-huh. the home of the Lebowski Fest. So. And what happens then? What ha- well, I, they, they watch them. It's been going on for like 15, 16 years every year. You know, it's, it's just one of those. I know they have different movies like that all around the country, the festivals. But uh, they watch the movie. They, they've got games where, you know, taking little scenes from the movie and they've made it a game. They always have some bands around to play songs from the soundtrack and, and uh-huh. all that. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of kitschy that fun. That sounds cool. Yeah. I like it. That's a lot of fun. So you're you're actually well represented here in Louisville, at least once a year, beyond all the usual radio airplay. So. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. Yeah, Credence gets as much airplay as anybody. Yeah, <clears throat> maybe well. more to the chagrin of new artists. You know? <laughs> well, it just goes to say, you know, th- to show how well these songs were were crafted and everything. And I, you know, you, so you know, when you had you know the the original run and everything, and those songs and the Chronicle greatest hits, but to turn around with Recollection or recollection. I think it's however you might say that. With the either re- way, yeah. With revisited it works both ways. That was sort of the the idea. Yeah. Well, well, you know, with when you all did that again, to have that success prove itself again. I mean, because that became a platinum selling record in itself. I that's mean, right. That's yeah. right. It's a double out, double platinum uh, album. That says everything about those songs right there and what you all did. And and you know, I thank you all for the music, and, and I know many people do. But uh, I, I'm so happy that it you know it, it happened the way it did. Yeah, it's a uh, very we you know all of us realize that we we're blessed that we you know we could still scratch our heads and wonder how how we could have had not not only one but two great careers from the original work it's uh it's, it's amazing we even had one career actually <laughs> <laughs> given the music business right congratulations on all of that and uh and and you know congratulations on uh, on knowing when to that, that when to, to hang it up for yourself you know and to do other things um be looking forward to this uh, this farewell tour and catching you guys out there and i'll i'll make mention of a, a special show september 25th i know that's in partnership with the museum of making music friends of the san pasquale academy which is a nice uh, good turn part of this uh, this tour so um Stu, it's been a pleasure talking to you thank you so much for doing this all right i'll see everybody at the belly up tavern in solana beach for this great event that's coming up all right uh take care ma'am we'll see you around nice talking with you have a good day you too bye cheers My thanks there, Stu Cook. And of course, with Doug Cosmo Clifford again, the brand new record is called For All the Money in the World. Uh, Thanks to you for checking this out. Hit that subscribe button before you get out of here. Again, three brand new interviews every single week. New ones every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. 
uh, at iTunes and Apple Podcasts, at Spotify, Acast, Podchaser, NPR, YouTube for the video versions, or anywhere you get your podcasts from. Subscribe to Kyle Meredith with. After that, head over to WFPK.org, where I do a show Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern, an hour full of song premieres, music news, anniversary spins, bonus interviews, Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern, at WFPK.org. Consequence has your music and film news. You can also find me on the social media spots, including Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all three of them, at Kyle Meredith. I do hope you like and follow along. That does it for another edition. I'm Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time. Consequence Podcast Network. It's easy to hear your favorite artist on WFPK from wherever you are. Listen on your smart speaker, live stream from our website at WFPK.org from Louisville Public Media.